Um, so I'm uh, Ryan Schmidt. I'm an engineering fellow at Epic Games, uh, and this is Russell Paul. He's a product manager, uh, and he works with me uh, and the rest of the team that's been building modeling mode uh, in the Unreal Editor for the past four years or so, um, and geometry scripting. So this, we didn't, it didn't fit on the slide, but we're also going to talk about geometry scripting uh, in this session a little bit. This is going to be pretty high level because we've only got 49 and a half minutes left. Um, Okay, so modeling mode, geometry scripting, what are these things? If you just came to this session, you have not heard about this before. Uh, modeling mode is a, you know, an editor mode, an Unreal Editor, where you can create and edit meshes. So static mesh assets, also volumes, gameplay volumes, also something called dynamic meshes that we're not super gonna get into uh, in, this, in this talk. But basically, doing your modeling like you might do in a DCC tool, but directly in the editor. And then geometry scripting is a blueprint in Python library for creating and editing meshes also. So basically if you think like modeling mode is a bunch of interactive tools where you're you know, pointing and clicking, geometry script is the, the script version where you're doing stuff you know, by wiring up nodes to generate meshes and things like that. And we'll show you examples of both of these things. Um, but I'm gonna give you a bit of high level first because when we say oh, we're doing modeling in UE now, generally people have a lot of questions like, what are you doing? Are you trying to you know, replace Blender? Um, is it just a replacement for VSP? What, what is this? What's the goals? Um, so I'm gonna try and give you a sense of that um, so you know what to, what to go to modeling mode for and what it's not ready for yet. So first of all, UE's always had some modeling, right? If you've ever used VSPs or you know, changed the shape of a gameplay volume, you've done a little bit of modeling in UE. VSP editor mode is ancient in UE. It's been there forever, Tim Sweeney you know, wrote the initial version. Um, and the reason that had to be an Unreal Editor right from the very beginning is when you're doing level design, it has to happen in the level, right? You can't, I mean, you can, but it's very hard to do your level design in some other DCC and import each part one by one uh, and stuff like that because you want to see it all in context kind of in the world. Um, and one of the, one of the, you know, things that's happened over time with BSP mode is that the level geometry in games has just gotten too complicated uh, to build with BSP and CSG tools. So here's an example of something that was built with BSP, right? This is uh, one of the original Unreal Tournament maps. Um, you know, it's pretty low poly for a modern, modern game. This is our new Lyra sample project uh, in UE5, right? If you just compare these two, we also think of this as like a, you know, essentially kind of almost just slightly above gray boxing uh, level. We're not, there's not really super detailed geometry here, but there is, you know, rounds on all the corners in there, and the instead of ramps, the stairs have steps, all sorts of stuff that building this in BSP would be really cumbersome. Uh, so, so, but you, you know, also building this piece by piece in a DCC would be, you know, really hard. So you want to do that in the editor. But if you were going to build the level out of meshes, right, you know, before modeling mode, essentially what that meant is you did have to make the pieces in an external DCC and continually re-import them. Right? And so you had all these in iterations, going to the DCC, making a little tweak, bringing it back to the editor over and over. If it wasn't something you could do with a basic you know, transform, you're iterating like that with an external tool. Um, you know, and then if you ended up in a situation where you wanted to avoid those re-import iterations, your other option was to essentially take part of your level and export it to a DCC. Uh, and we saw internal artists doing this a lot you know, they can end up exporting millions of triangles to an external DCC just so that they can design a, something that fits in there. Um, so it's real painful. And so really the motivation for all of this was like, what if you could do that modeling directly in UE? That, you know, your iterations would be fast and easy. That's the, that's the idea. And I'll show you kind of an extreme example of that. Um, so this is from the ancient game uh, sample project or Valley of the Ancients. Uh, and so this level, you know, this wasn't hand modeled each vertex. This is mostly Quixel assets that have been kind of kitbashed together. You know, on the screen right here, because of Nanite, we're looking at like effectively hundreds of millions of triangles, possibly even billions. I'm, you know, we don't even really think about it anymore. Um, and, you know, that's, that's awesome, but maybe your uh, art director comes and is like, well, you've got those stairs there, in, you know, in front of that little archway, and we want those to just be a little bit curved, right? This is the kind of thing I've seen art directors say to the artists. Um, and so, you know, if you're the artist, you're like, well, that's, that asset isn't curved, it came from Quixel. It's like, it's a scan mesh with two million triangles, and I gotta somehow bend it, 
right? So I'm not gonna take it into Maya, do a bend deformer, re-import it, re-importing two million triangles takes a long time, right? And then it's not quite right, I gotta tweak it a little bit. So, you know, with modeling mode, now our, our, our Quixel artists who built this level can do that right in the editor. They can just bend that piece. Now they're editing the asset, so this isn't some kind of runtime deformer. This is gonna change the shape of that part, but they can do it and they can try lots of variations really quickly. And so this is when I say, avoiding iterations with an external DCC, this is what I'm talking about. Um, and if you wanna see like a lot more examples of what our Quixel artists do with their Quixel assets and this kind of stuff, uh, this is actually now quite old. They did this in 2020 and it was published in 2021. They built this medieval village out of Quixel assets and using the modeling tools. And they have a series of videos uh, showing how they use the modeling tools. So this, this house here, uh, is built all out of Quixel assets, but you won't find any of those shapes directly in the Quixel library because they took them and they customized them to build this house. They, they bent things, you know, they reassembled them in different ways, the different pieces, stuff like that. Um, they have the roof here, they, you know, used our sculpting tools to kind of rough it out and then they did some blueprint stuff, the tile, the thatch scans over top of it and things like that. So this is a really interesting, if you want to kind of get a sense of that workflow, um, which we kind of see as, a sort of future workflow of working with asset library content. And this leads us to the other big reason we had to do this, is that when you start working with nanite scale content, you start to really struggle with a lot of DCC tools. Like if you try and bring a two million triangle mesh into most DCCs, they don't love it. They're not really designed to work with 2,000, or sorry, two million triangle raw meshes, right? Uh, they work with two million triangle sub D meshes, which are sort of more efficient, but that's not what you get out of a 3D scanner. Um, and really, any kind of unstructured triangle mesh data, even if it's not two million triangles, uh, you really tend to struggle with that in DCC tools. And there's, a, there's like lots of specialist tools for working with scans and repairing scans and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's, you know, and also things like from asset stores where they might have been already pre-optimized for game use. Um, DCC tools generally don't focus on that as a type of thing you wanna work with, but in, in a real-time engine like Unreal, this is what you have almost all the time. And so modeling mode is trying to you know, solve these problems, um, make it easy to work with that kind of stuff, to do what you need to do. So here's a sort of simple example. You know, mesh booleans are a thing that everyone is familiar with. We've built our mesh booleans to be able to handle these huge meshes. Um, so these are two, two million triangle Quixel. A lot of them are two million triangles. That's a very standard, like Quixel put, tends to make things certain sizes. So they are generally two million triangles, plus or minus a couple, I'm always saying that. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna make a cave in this part on the left. So I'm just gonna take this part on the right. I don't wanna model that cave because I'm not a good modeler. So I'm just gonna stick this in there and subtract it. Now these are nanite meshes right now. Like if you zoom in, you see they're super high res. And you notice also this one, it's got a giant hole in the back. So this is usually a situation where you say I'm gonna do a mesh boolean. This could be real bad. There's people shaking their heads. Yeah, it's usually not great. So this totally works though. Our mesh boolean, uh, we built it in a way um, because we don't, I'll get to this later, because we don't support polygons, we only support triangles, we can do this much more robustly. It did take about a minute to do this, to do the, compute the Boolean, um, but it totally works, comes out nice and clean, and I've made a cave in here, essentially by just mashing up these two assets. So when I say like, people are kit bashing these Quixel assets, this is the kind of stuff I mean. You're like using them in creative ways to make new content uh, that isn't just from, directly from the content library. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, another problem that we've uh, worked on is UVs. So, you know, no one likes UVs in general. No one likes to UV something that's a couple hundred thousand triangles or a couple million. So we have this new method called Patch Builder. Uh, so this is recorded in real time. This is 170,000 triangles, you know, and it auto UVs this thing in a couple seconds. Um, and it can go up to millions of triangles. Millions of triangles will take you like a minute or two for around one to two million. Um, and there's settings and stuff like that. I'm not gonna get into, you know, I wouldn't say this is the perfect solution yet, but this is the kind of stuff we're trying to simplify because then once, you, once we can auto UV these high res models, then we can do things like, also in the editor, bake down to lower poly stuff. So here I've taken a raw scan, this is a raw reality capture scan. It's got holes, it's got stuff we didn't want in the scan, it's got this base on it. And I've purely in the editor, editor tools cleaned it up into like, a clean scan that I might use as an asset. And then I baked it down, so I baked uh, all the different color maps and normal map down to 2,000 triangles. 
Um, so there's a, I have a video series about this on YouTube um, that we'll mention at the end um, about completely doing this in the editor. Uh, and, you know, that's cool, but also it is a lot of steps. It's an hour long video, right? It doesn't take an hour to do it. It only takes about five minutes. But really, really what you want is you want to be able to experiment. Like if this is a statue in your game, you want to be like, is 2,000 triangles the right number? What resolution do I need on that, on that bake? So here's another example. Um, this is a Quixel. Uh, you know, sort of step scan, it's the same thing about two million triangles. Uh, and this is a tool called Autolod that we have in modeling mode, which essentially automates this process. process. It does the sort of mesh abstraction, and then it does the auto UV, and then it does the baking, all in a single shot. So it's got this big complex settings panel, but I'm just gonna change the triangle count here. So I'm setting it to 5,000, and you're gonna see on the right, it's gonna recompute. So there was a little bit of a pre-compute before I started this. So this part here is only gonna take a few seconds. Um, so that's a 5,000 triangle version. And then I'm gonna change it to 1,000 or, yeah, 1,000. Um, so now, you know, less resolution, I could change the bake resolution and, you know, try, try variations very quickly. If you think about doing this with a bunch of external tools, you know, you'd have to go to one thing to simplify it, one thing to UV it, uh, one thing to do the baking, re-import, that whole process would be very tedious. So this went down to 500. 500 is probably too low, but then maybe if it's far in the background, that's fine. You know, that's, you can zoom out and try it, right in Unreal, see what it's gonna look like in your game. Um, so, so these are some of the examples. I mean, there's just a few. There's like 80 some tools in modeling mode. Uh, we, I couldn't even really, you know, describe them each in one minute in this, um, in this session. So I, I'm not gonna go into tools in too much detail. I'm just gonna tell you sort of like, like I said at the beginning, what are we building modeling mode for? So, you know, our focuses are really on creating level and environment assets, you know, um, the things you would build the game world out of. Uh, and in that context, a lot of our focus so far has been on customizing assets that you've already imported. They already exist, and you wanna tailor them for your context. You wanna like reuse them in some way or another so things like scan meshes, like Quixel Reality Capture, any way you get scans in the engine, and then asset library content, like Sketchfab, and our UE Marketplace, and stuff like that. Um, and really, like I said at the beginning, it's really just about helping you avoid these DCC round trips, uh, and then helping you, like I showed here at the, the end of this little beginning part, um, optimize your meshes for use in your game, in UE, for real time. Uh, but I also wanna tell you what we're not doing because this is something that people run into right away. They're like, oh, awesome, modeling in UE. Go in there, and like, where's the quads? This is, we, oh, lots of artists come, and they say, <laughs> could we just have quads? And we don't have quads. So in UE, we only have triangles. The meshes are only triangles. We have a thing called polygroups, which I think Russell's gonna talk about, that is like a way to kinda of do poly-like stuff, quad and poly-like stuff. Uh, this is the kind of thing we, you know, we're kind of inventing as we go along and trying to make that smoother. But if you are, you know, want to make your hero character and you want to do sub-D poly modeling to make that hero character, uh, you know, these aren't the tools you want to use for that, let's say, yet. Um, but, uh, you know, Blender's awesome. Use Blender. Um, if you want to tweak that stuff after you brought it in, we can do a lot of that. Um, but uh, just to be super clear that, you know, our focus for our kind of uh, polygroup modeling that we've been doing so far is really about things like level blockout more than, you know, high-end poly modeling. Um, and currently, we don't really have any texturing or painting tools. Um, we've so sort of focused more on this sort of like uh, material-based stuff where you're using tiling textures and, you know, world space projection and things like that. Um, but this is something we're looking into. Uh, and so Russell's gonna give you a, a demo now, but I was just gonna mention before that, uh, you know, we've only got a bit of time here for demo, so um, there's a video from the state of Unreal 22 when we launched 5.0, uh, Aaron Lang made one of our evangelists made, uh, where this whole scene here, you know, just to give you a sense of what you can model from scratch already, this whole scene here, he builds up from scratch in this video, um, except for the characters. But all of the sort of rocks and bridge and stuff like that, this is in Quixel content, this is all created in the editor uh, and sort of assembled in, in interesting ways. Um, but to give you a sort of flavor of how that works, I'm gonna hand it off to Russell. He's gonna show you things. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Uh, let me do a, where's my old, there's the tab button on this thing. <clears throat> All right, so, hey everybody. Um, good to 
Good to see you, although I can't see through the light source here. I mean, um, I got ahead of myself with this, uh, what we were working on earlier. So where's my thing? Throw that on there. So um, one of the things that Ryan was talking about was, um, you know, how, how we're using the tools right now for, for uh, blocking out some stuff. And so this is a good way to sort of just introduce you to where all the tools are. So um, first things first, so just for those of you who haven't tried it, so if you're launch Unreal, the first thing is under selection mode, just go to modeling. And once you're there, then you're going to get um, this palette of tools over here. And as Ryan said, it's there's quite a quite a lot of tools here. You're, I mean, we're, we're certainly not going to go through everything. There's there's modeling tools, there's for creating geometry, for basic shapes, there's remeshing tools, simplification tools. There, there's a wide range of tools that you can uh, get in here and explore. Um, you know, and we're not going to go through all this. So I just want to kind of give you guys a little bit of an intro and show you some of the fun things that you can do. And as people have mentioned to me, this is Blocktober, so I guess we're, we're going to play with some uh, blocking out of some environments. So um, this is just, I've been, uh, you know, like everybody else in the world, I, I went to Italy this, this last year. So, um, you know, so of course I, I decided that, well, I was in Venice, so maybe I'll make some little um, Venice-esque kind of, kind of environment. So these are just some little tool, little areas and little things that I started to make. So we'll, we'll make some other things. These are just the windows, and I figure I'll start to place these around in the rest of my space just to do some stuff. So <clears throat> we'll start off here just to give you an intro. So for instance, like, Everybody here is probably used to uh, just using the place, place cube tool, place you know sphere. But there's this really great set of shapes up here, and what's great about these is you have a little bit more control over um, over what's happening with the shape. So even just like a simple box, you can define you know how tall or how small you want it to make. You can change the subdivisions of it if you want it to have more resolution or less resolution, um, and all of these things can help you know um, go ahead and and do other types of modeling operations with it later. So Ryan mentioned this polygroups. So um, the polygroups basically are, they're, they're just groups of triangles. But you know, on these primitive shapes, the groups of triangles can be sort of organized as if they were kind of, they're kind of quads. They're squares, two triangles put together. And that gives us the opportunity to do some um, kind of more traditional box modeling approaches that you expect to have on those kind of things. So um, let's just go ahead and let's say, instead of doing this, that, I'm going to throw a cylinder in here. Um, and then we're going to check my time. Okay, good. Um, and instead of having, you know, all 16 sessions, let's just do, you know, uh, six, you know, for whatever reason, because we're going to make a little pedestal for something in the center of our piazza. You can drop that in. Um, and once we have that, we can obviously do all the regular stuff to it. But there's this um, tool called PolyEdit. And it's not Polygon, it's Polygroup, which, um, and but PolyEdit gives you the opportunity, and, and you can see here that as I move around, I'm getting a representation of like what is, you know, uh, you guys might think of a quad, but it's actually two triangles underneath here. Um, and then from there, find that guy right there, we can start to do things like, for instance, you know, insert an edge loop if we wanted to, that we maybe want to go ahead and, you know, insert a couple edge loops, or say we're done with that guy, we can just change our selection mode so we're only selecting the faces, you know, scale those up, you know, and then let's see, let's grab the, maybe just grab that upper point here, slide that down, you know, just to make whatever we want here. Let's see, and we want to move that. I'm making this up as I go. I didn't really have a plan when I showed up this morning. I just want to show you guys some, some stuff. I think uh, maybe we do need some sort of weird thing that they captured from, you know, some in invasion of past decades. And let's see, we'll scale that down. I don't, I'm not going to make you guys sit there and watch me model for the rest of the day, but. Um, maybe want to go ahead and grab that guy and just do a quick little bevel on it. Just see what we have, what we have, you know, and then we can. The great thing about all of this stuff in, is that I actually started this whole setup in the, the standard third-person template, and so any of the stuff that you're doing now, I can always just go ahead and I can hit play, 
and I can go, now I can kind of walk over to whatever it is I'm doing, and I can start to make the decisions about, oh, does this, is this too big or too small? Does it kind of fit with what I want to have? And then, you know, if, it, if it's not, I can just kind of, you know, bail out and I can make some changes to it directly in here without having to go anywhere else. Like, you know, maybe I, maybe I don't want that guy in here at all, or maybe what I want to have is I want to have, you know, this is one of my new favorite tools in here is, uh, is this pattern tool. I'll put it over here. So there's this great pattern tool here and I'll say, okay, well, maybe we need this uh, to go around in this, this little area to block it off. And so we can say, you know, give me a circle. Let's move this guy over here, you know, and you can, maybe these need to be less or more, whatever it is, you know. So you can do all sorts of really fun stuff by just actually just quickly kind of iterating through these things. So those are all some, some really simple, you know, modeling tools. There's a ton of stuff in here um, that you can do as well. But then it doesn't stop there. Like, you know, for instance, right now, this is just the, um, the standard grid that shows up as part of the, the blocking tools. But what happens if we wanted to go ahead and um, actually do some, put some textures on it? And so, you know, I was just, for example, or you were playing with like this cobblestone, you know, texture. I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's put some, the cobblestones on it like that. Um, we did a quick UV projection on it um, there, with some of the UV tools here. Um, but I also have a tool here called XForm UVs, which is great because you can just click on um, that and then that gives you like direct control over the UVs themselves. You know, so if we wanted to go ahead and tweak the UVs. So I'm not actually having to go in and tile the map or do anything like that. It works on directly in the UVs. And if you wanted to go a step further, you could actually take the object itself right here and there's a UV editor button right just right here. You can just click on the UV editor and now we actually have, you know, sort of your more classic 2D UV editing um, tool. So you can go ahead and, you know, decide if I want to go ahead and, you know, select some edges in here, you know, and, and cut them and, and lay them out. Or maybe I just want to select my islands here. Oh. It's too small. Select my island, you know, and then, and then move it around or scale it. And that's actually adjusting the UVs of the, of, the, um, of the mesh. So these are all sort of small little tools that really are helping you to avoid those, like we said, avoid those round trips of going back to the DCC. Oh, I just want to scale the UVs. I just want to get some, tweak something that, that's broken. I want to, ex, you know, cut a piece off of something or build a little cube and extract it out into a building. And then I want to, you know, go ahead and see that kind of stuff. So all of these things are there to help you do that stuff. And, and the best thing about it is, is that at any time you can just send a, Go back to your starting point, and then you can, you know, go look around, see what this is, you know. And then when you're done in this little space, then you know, I can't run very fast. Sorry, you know, those obviously those are too big. But you know, you can start to explore other places, you know, in your little town right here. You know, I started to block out my my steps. I use the uh, the step shape tool here to, you know, do my steps and starting to put my little canals and my water out in that space. back out to my piazza. You know, and all of these buildings here were all just sort of, you know, simple, simple cube shapes with the quick little library of windows and elements that I have that I can then drop in and then I can, you know, continue to up res and, and add detail to any one of those as I need. Or what's great is I can grab any one of those um, windows and say, okay, I want to actually make a new one that has more complexity to it or maybe makes one that's a slight variation on it. Um, so that I have a, a, a larger kit that I'm going to then go out, go in and up risk. But I know exactly what I have, what I need to build to, to sort of finish up my environment. So um, yeah, so that's that's kind of a, a quick introduction. Um, any other? Am I tight on time? Or? A couple more minutes. A couple. If you want to? Uh, no, I think I'm good. There's all sorts of. I mean, basically, there's a lot, just a ton more tools in here, and I think a lot of them will be really helpful for you guys. Probably the one that is probably the most important that probably have is there's some pivot tools in here. So um, I'll definitely show that one. So just centering your pivot or putting it at the bottom of your mesh, you can you know interactively drag it. If you hold down the control key, you can get a snap. So if you want to snap it to the front face of your um, mesh, you can then head and go ahead and you know set that there. Um, just be aware that you are setting the pivot point for your mesh. So any instances will now get, you know, might get a little pop if you change the pivot point. Um, 
There's also um, uh, baking tools in here. So if you want to, if you have scale values associated with anything or rotations, you can always head, go ahead and um, bake those values back into it. So that 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 does help with a lot of a um, lot of functionality if you need to have the, any of those tools in here. Um, and there's some really great tools in here for doing um, you know things like lattices where you're just like, oh, this isn't going to lattice very well because it's just you know a basic uh, a cubic shape. But there's um, tools in here for lattices um, and. Uh, and other things, uh, some sculpting tools. If you want to go ahead and, you know, go ahead and destroy what you just made with sculpting, or no, I'm not gonna, okay. I'll cancel that one. Um, and once again, there's just there's a whole slew of tools in here for helping you to help build build out these spaces, build out these shapes, or if you're importing CAD data or other things, go ahead and clean them up, get them prepped, weld edges, um, close up holes, um, remesh topology. Um, there's there's a lot of a lot of wide variety of functionality to help with the, whatever process you have um, in in the, you know in working with the geometry stuff. So with that very very quick intro, I'm going to kick it back to Ryan. He's going to go over geometry scripting right. next. Cool. Wish we had more time because I'm sitting here watching him do that and I'm like, oh, you should. Yeah. Uh, next Sub next demo. Subdivide it. And subdivide it. it and that was we do other. have sub D. I said we, it's not really for sub D modeling, but we do have a sub D. Does Catmull Clark sub D on the poly group topology? So, yeah, so that's so a really nice. If thing. you were to follow that little box modeling approach and you kept everything as, as sort of quad shaped poly groups, there, the sub D tool there will get, allow you to use Catmull Clark as kind of a normal process. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. it bakes it in though. It's not yeah. a procedural thing unless you do it with geometry scripting. <laughs> um, so, what is geometry scripting? Uh, like I said, it's a bunch of blueprint functions so that you can wire stuff up in a node graph to do editor modeling. So it's gotten quite large in, in uh, 5.0 when we first released it. It was about 150 functions. Now I put about 200 plus. I think it's actually like closer to 250, but I, we sort of just don't count them anymore. Um, it also works with Python. So I'm going to show you blueprint stuff, but you can do the same kind of stuff in Python where maybe if you're a programmer um, and you want to do procedural geometry with programming, it's actually really, really nice for that. Um, there's two kind of main use cases are these editor utilities and sort of procedural mesh objects. Um, I'm not going to show you editor utilities. There's a great course uh, later today um, where Tim Armstrong, um, he's a UE product specialist, uh, he's going to give a whole intro to geometry scripting and a lot of it's going to be focused on editor utilities and that's in room 281. Um, but what I'm going to show you or try and do is a super quick live demo of uh, geometry scripting. Um, I guess we can just do it right here. We can make a, uh, let's go back to selection. So one thing to know about geometry scripting is it's an, it's currently a experimental plugin, so you gotta turn it on. It's already turned on in this project, but if you go in and find the geometry script plugin, turn it on, restart your editor, then you can do what I'm gonna show. Um, I'm gonna pin this content browser. So I'm just gonna go down here and right click, and right click, oh, I gotta go into content, and make a new blueprint class. The base, base class is going to be generated dynamic mesh actor. It's long, um, but I'll just type generated. It'll generally come up. Um, I'm just going to call it box. Uh, so I'm going to go in there, edit the blueprint. So this is um, a kind of specific thing, and uh, we can point you to how you do this. So you don't use the construction script here to do this. What you do is in the event graph, you right click. There's a function called rebuild generated mesh. Just a rebuild and it usually comes up. And you want to, off of that, do all of your procedural mesh generation. So I'm just going to go here, target mesh, drag off there, and go and box. Um, I'm going to add a variable because otherwise you can't really tell it's procedural. Call it height, make that a float, make it public, compile this so I can set the default height, drag that in. So I'm trying to do this as fast as I can. And I'm going to set that as the height of the box, dimension Z. Okay, now if I drag that box in, I got a procedural box. That height parameter appears over here in the panel. So this isn't scaling it. This is re regenerating each frame a new box uh, mesh. And you, I, can, I can prove that to you by putting in a bevel. So we'll do apply mesh polygroup bevel. And I'll do bevel. Oh, actually, I can delete this. I can duplicate this. Compile it again. You have to click compile so many times. There's probably a hotkey, <laughs> but I don't know it. We're going to split this. 
here, and I'll wire that bevel in there. And so now you see the box is beveled, right? And I can change that bevel parameter, um, and I can change the height. Now, I got time, I think. <laughs> um, you know, so that's pretty simple shape, but maybe you want to take it further. Maybe you want to, like, you know, be able to make windows and stuff like that uh, in that box. Maybe it's going to be a wall panel. So um, I'm going to do a little bit of a couple nodes here. So I'm going to do this allocate compute mesh. That's going to make me, like, a temporary, um, temporary mesh I can use. Um, and I'm going to make another parameter here called, let's say we'll call it position. I'm going to set that to vector. So this is going to be like a 3D position. And I'm going to check this show 3D widget over here, which does this super cool thing. So I'm going to get that position, split this transform. Um, and then off of our other mesh. So, so this allocate compute mesh made like a kind of second mesh in this blueprint. Um, now I'm going to Boolean them together, because you need two things to do a Boolean, right? So that was the target, and this other sphere I made is going to be the tool. Um, and then I just have to do one more thing here, which is release all compute meshes. So hard to get into this right now, but this basically gets rid of that temporary mesh, which you want to you do in here. And I'm going to change this to a subtract. Now if I compile and go back here, now you see, if we go under the map, you can see that it got subtracted there. I can select this little box here. Right, and now I'm moving that cube or that sphere through here, and it's doing a boolean. So that's now part of the part of the object, right? And I can make multiple instances. This one's not as tall. Let me select this little thing, right? And move that over here. So um, I've kind of built up a little parametric object. I mean, I'm not going to take it further than this. This is a really simple example, um, but I'm going to show you some sort of more, uh, much more extensive things that people have done. Uh, and it's essentially the same process. You're just kind of building out a blueprint with these nodes doing, doing mesh operations. The range of operations on a CDS 250 go from being able to like triangle by triangle build up a shape to very high level operations like baking. You can do our, the baking I mentioned before, you can do that in script. Um, doing things like voxelizing something or voxelizing a bunch of things. Uh, and actually the demo I'm going to show you, this is a video of a one I made. So the same, exact same stuff I showed, just you know, spending more time. So I'm using raycasts to place boxes on this bunny, all as one mesh, and then I'm throwing some of them away and making them spheres, and uh, kind of turning them to an SDF and blending them together, and then doing some mesh smoothing and remeshing to make this kind of green goop on this bunny. And so this would work on any shape, basically. I set the target for that blueprint mesh as this bunny, so I could change that to anything else. Um, um, and that took me like maybe half an hour to build that blueprint. There's some demos online of doing that same operation, making snow on top of rocks. That's right. Some people have made some great, great videos. Um, so something uh, as as we were develop, developing this, the Lyra project, uh, which I mentioned before, our new sample game, they kind of discovered that we were doing this and were like, could we use this for the level design? Like, could we make all our level out of? They were trying to figure out a way to do kind of procedural level pieces. So there's a one tech artist on Lyra. Uh, he made about 10 different um, blueprint elements. Um, and so this video here is an example of one element. So this is like a wall piece that has a hole, optional hole, like I showed you before, but it's resizable in all the dimensions. And you can round the corners. Um, and you can round the window. You can resize the window. You can use that gizmo thing I showed to move it around. Uh, you can do all sorts of other stuff. I couldn't possibly show all the options. You can add a glass panel. Uh, you can mirror it and things like that. Right, you can add little borders around all the parts, and you can assign materials to all these different pieces. And this is just one of them. So there's ones for like making archways and floor panels and stuff like that. And then the level designer basically took these blueprints and built the whole level using these elements. Uh, and then in the end, they bake them. So these aren't static meshes. They're these dynamic meshes, which are a new kind of mesh that is good for this kind of procedural stuff. And then in the end, they bake them down to static meshes. But so this, almost everything, so I could tell you like the stuff that isn't made that way, um, is mostly this walkway, these like glass side panels. I think they just hand modeled them. Um, but almost everything you see here is made using these procedural scripts. Um, and the, the part of the reason they did that was so they could do non-destructive editing. So this is a sort of example of that, where basically this piece here is kind of like the example piece uh, that they can, 
it's like the procedural piece, they can swap in and out and then they can make that change and update the rest of the level that use that piece, right? Um, so, uh, you know, this is actually all shipped in the Relyra sample game. Um, there's some videos about how to, how to, it, it requires a little bit of understanding of how the, proceed, the link between the procedural pieces and the stat, baked static meshes are set up. Um, but you can essentially swap in the procedural version for any of the baked versions and do like an edit in context and then bake it back and swap it out. Um, and that's all part of the liar sample game. Um, so uh, at the beginning, the, the title of this talk was past, present, future. So I mean, the past was BSP mode. Uh, in the future, we're, you know, we can't say too much. Um, but uh, that thing I just showed you where we were, I said, I just described, and you, maybe you were started to wonder, like, it sounds complicated. Uh, to do that non-destructive editing. Um, you know, we see that as a huge thing for the future of trying to basically let you build level geometry non-destructively like you could with BSP, but using uh, geometry scripting and these kind of mesh, dynamic mesh objects. Um, so that's something we're really looking at as like um, something to build in the editor. So in Lyra, we did it all with blueprints and kind of editor utilities. But what we want to do is build this in as sort of like a first class citizen in the editor like BSP mode was. Um, more functions, you know, when you sit down to use geometry script, you know, probably within you know, the first half hour, you're going to be like, oh, it'd be really great if I had a function to do X, and you're going to find out we don't have that function. Um, although there's a lot of them, there's always new things that people think of, like it'd be great if it could do this. So we're always looking to kind of expand the function set. Um, and then closer connection between geometry scripting and modeling tools. So, you know, We've got these modeling tools Russell showed that can edit shapes, and we've got these procedural stuff that can edit shapes, and a natural thing to ask is like, what about history, like in uh, Blender or 3ds Max or Maya? And so, you know, maybe you can imagine ways to put these two things together, uh, and we're thinking about that too, about how we can um, sort of somehow uh, bring together the proceduralism and the interactive modeling. Um, and then in modeling tools, uh, a big thing we're looking at is sort of usability and UX enhancements, uh, especially that tool palette, like Russell showed the monster tool palette. Um, we have some ability to, we have some videos about customizing the colors of things, um, which can help a little bit, but it is hard to use that huge tool palette of 80 icons, right? Uh, and so we're looking at redesigning that palette. Um, and then finally, the, the sort of polygroup modeling Russell showed, if you, if you saw or if you've tried this yourself, you know, you have to go into a tool to do selection. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have selection as like a mode-wide thing in modeling mode right now like most DCCs do. Um, and that has to do with sort of building stuff in Unreal Engine. It's a, it's a different beast than a DCC tool. But we are working on that. So this is something um, that we've just been sort of working on and um, hopefully we'll see in 5.2. Um, it's actually, you can turn it on in 5.1. I, I, there's, a, there's a setting to turn on what, you're, what I'm showing right here. But essentially this is allowing, uh, I don't know, oh there it is. If you, this is allowing selection in the mode. So I'm not in a tool right here. I'm just selecting faces on things and moving them. Um, and this is the thing that you know, everyone asks for when they try modeling tools to do this kind of blackout stuff. And so we're working on trying to give that to you. Uh, and that's the end of the talk. Uh, so um, thanks for listening. Um, Russell and I did a, a, a live stream on Twitch that's like a much longer version of this kind of demos. Um, so you can find those if you search for this, Exploring Geometry Tools in UE5, uh, or search for my name or Russell's name. I think it'll generally come up. Um, I post a bunch of videos, tutorial, short tutorials on geometry script and modeling tools uh, on my YouTube channel, so that's Ryan Schmidt Epic, uh, and also on Twitter, RMS80 is my Twitter. Um, and really, if you go on, if you go on to uh, YouTube and search for geometry scripting, you'll actually find a ton of videos by other people, not us, who've been making really amazing stuff with geometry scripting that uh, our lawyers, you know, don't don't want us to just grab screenshots of everything and put them up on slides. So. I didn't bring any of that up in the talk, but there's amazing videos out there of people making uh, both like low, kind of simpler low poly shapes, but also extremely detailed like nanite geometry using geometry scripting. Um, so you should definitely check that out. Uh, and that's the end of it.